There's a lot of craziness going on in our society today. I don't have to tell you that. We all see it. We all feel it. But what to do with it? Well, let's answer that with a question. Is your faith dead or alive? And can you tell the difference? I think that faith is the key to get us and our families and our loved ones through the craziness of this world now and still that is more to come in our future. I know it's an uncomfortable question. Is your faith dead or alive? And do you know how to tell the difference? But our second reading and our gospel confronts us with this anyway, so let's just tackle it. St. James, our second reading. St. James explains that if somebody truly believes in Jesus Christ, then that person will follow Jesus Christ by loving God and loving neighbor, just as Jesus commanded us. Here we are today in a church, believing in Jesus Christ and in his teachings. So we can say that our faith is alive, not dead, right? Not so fast. St. James, remember, was writing to Catholics who went to Mass every Sunday. That's who the early Christians were. And that's not coming from a priest. That's coming from history. Even historians that are not religious, who are atheists, acknowledge that for the first 1,500 years of the Christian church, they were Catholic. And yet, here is St. James warning the first generation of Catholic Christians against having a dead faith. Why? Because some of them did. That should make us then think. Additionally, the curious exchange in today's gospel from Mark chapter 8 should also make us think. On the one hand, you have St. Peter professing his faith in Jesus Christ in a big, bold way. You're the Christ. You're the Messiah. And in the parallel gospel to this in Matthew, he says, and you're the Son of God. And Jesus is satisfied with that answer. And in Matthew's gospel, he acknowledges it, that Peter is right. So it would appear that Peter's faith is alive, right? But as soon as Jesus then goes on to explain who he really is believing in, that is, that in order to fulfill his mission as a savior, Jesus will have to be rejected, suffer, and die. Peter objects. And Jesus comes down hard upon Peter for his lack of faith. So much so that he says to Peter while he's looking at the rest, get behind me, Satan. The Hebrew word is Satan, and it means adversary. He's saying to him, you're now an adversary to me, fulfilling my mission. So here you have Peter professing faith, and in the same breath, then, when he realizes what faith takes, he becomes an obstacle to Jesus. Peter had faith, but his faith was not as alive as he thought. Peter was willing to follow Jesus through the miracles and the success of preaching engagements and the hundreds and then the thousands of people following Jesus and proclaiming him king and Peter thinking, hey, this is inaugurating the earthly kingdom and I'm in the inner circle. And then Peter offering what he thinks he knows is best for Jesus. But then Peter was not willing to follow Jesus to the cross. His faith may not, at this time, be completely dead, but neither was it alive, not vital as it should have been. And Peter learned from this, right? Like when everyone didn't follow Jesus to the cross, he didn't do it either. And after Christ's crucifixion, he woke up. 
He realized that his faith was dead, and he did something about it. And literally, he went to the cross at the end of his life and didn't see himself worthy of being crucified like Christ. So he asked Nero, when he was crucified in Nero's circus in Rome, crucify me upside down. I'm not worthy to be crucified as my Lord. What a change. And it came from Peter realizing the difference between a faith alive and a faith dead, and then doing something about it. So we should not be too quick to assume that our faith is alive as we might suppose it is. A strong, vibrant, mature faith, the kind that fills you with true Christian joy and wisdom, that gives us direction and purpose as our compass in this life, that, that gives us the strength from day to day to get through the craziness of this world, let alone a faith the one that is required for us to enter into heaven can only be acquired when our faith is put into action, according to St. James. He says, a faith does not, that does not produce works is dead. Does your faith produce good works? Well, let me ask it another way. Does your faith produce God's good works? And can you tell the difference between what you think is good works and what God knows is good works? So let me answer that question in this way, though. St. Mary, St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta was an elegant example of someone who expressed her faith through how she lived and what she did not just what she said or the fact that she went to church and professed what she believed in God. Her critics, and there were many, often accused her of proselytizing, that is, forcing poor and dying Hindu and Muslim people to become Catholics as a condition for her and her sisters caring for them. And we all know Mother Teresa from her famous life, but the, 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 the first years of her ministries in the streets of Calcutta, she was heavily criticized by the Muslims and the Hindus for doing that, which of course she didn't do, and even by Christians around the world for taking care of Hindus and Muslims. In fact, Mother Teresa's first clinic was a former Hindu pilgrimage residence which she turned into a hospital for the poor and the dying who were left in the streets by the Hindu and the Muslims who wouldn't take care of their sick when they got sick and they didn't have the health care systems that we have in this land. So they literally were landed in the streets to die and no one, even family members, took care of them. Except for her and her sisters. In fact, the local Hindus Hindu leaders were not too happy about this, and what they suspected is that she was using the site to, com to force conversions. Gangs of hostile locals harried the sisters as they roamed through Calcutta's slums every day, scooping up destitute people lying in the, in the gutters. Neighbors, sometimes family members of the dying, threw sticks and stones and dirt and other things at them, the sisters, as they carried in their wretched patients. Finally, a police commissioner arrived to close down the clinic. Mother Teresa invited him into the clinic. He entered, he looked around, he saw on the beds and on the floors full of sick and dying people. And he watched as the sisters knelt down beside these maimed, helpless, and abandoned people, not preaching at them, but bathing their wounds, cleaning them, feeding them, praying over them, and loving them. The stunned commissioner walked back out the front door that he came in and dispersed the angry crowd, telling them 
that he would stop Mother Teresa and her sisters only when the neighbors persuaded their wives and sisters and brothers and fathers to take over the work of the nuns had started. Indeed, many conversions happen in the slums of Calcutta, but because the sisters put their faith into action. If we have a lively faith in Jesus Christ, a faith that impacts our life year over year, more and more, and impacts the lives of other people year over year, more and more, because that's a growing faith, then we will experience more of the deep meaning in life that God wants us to experience. And we will be able to share our faith with other people because we will be motivated to do that. We will not just believe in Jesus. We will follow him no matter the conditions of our lives. We will not just sit in a church and worship him on a Sunday morning. We will conform our will to his choose him and put our faith into action for the good of others rather than living our lives for our own good. Our faith will have works, God's good works. So of course, this should beg the question in all of us, how or what can we do to keep our faith alive and growing year after year? so that our faith in action saves us and helps us save others through Jesus Christ. Well, this is what many saints, theologians, and spiritual writers through the ages have to say. They take their cue from what Jesus did in his life, who formed a company of disciples, a, a gathering, a, in Greek, an ecclesia, which is translated as church. And he discipled them they discipled one another, and then they went out and discipled others. All the spiritual writers agree that it is almost impossible to keep our faith alive and growing if we don't have strong spiritual friendships. And that's what Christ did. First with his disciples, and then taught him to do the same. Meaning, we don't do the Christian life alone. We do it with others, and specifically others who are committed to the same goal as we are. To have a lively faith, to grow this faith, to share this faith, and to put this faith into action. Christian community, strong spiritual friendships are the stuff that offer us good example, inspire us, encourage us, and fill us with hope, teach us the truth, keep us honest and accountable to one another, love us enough to love our souls first and foremost, protect us from the lies and deceits of our culture, lead us away from sin, offer us joy and an authentic life, and help us to encounter the living God, rather than friends who distract us, who pull us away from God, or don't even know how to bring us to God. So. If keeping our faith robust and putting it in action matters to you because it matters to our salvation, according to St. James and Jesus, we will make a point of building friendships with others who have the same priority as us. Likewise, of course, along the way, we will build and grow our lifelong spiritual friendship with Jesus Christ. We won't be just satisfied with believing in him that's just head. That's just knowledge stuff. And then therefore we won't deceive ourselves into thinking this is enough. We will want a friendship with Jesus that walks with him day to day no matter where he leads us. Chooses him as our priority. Follows him and serves him and others as we put our faith into action. Along these lines, we can say as the saying goes, accomplish two things at once by making a commitment today to steward the precious time that God will give you this year to build and grow our spiritual friendships with God and our spiritual friendships with other people. As you remember two weeks ago, I invited you all to take some time to learn about, pray about, and decide to make a commitment. 
Uh, that was the beginning of our stewardship of time drive. And um, I had you look at a brochure and also take home a card, a commitment card. And I asked you at that time to make a commitment to at least one ongoing faith growing opportunity throughout the year, like joining a, a faith group, a discipleship group, or a Bible study. And then also at least one one-time event, like a retreat, a conference, or mission. In order to grow your faith here at St. Francis, then fill out a, a commitment card. Then today, place your commitment card at the foot of the altar as an offering to God for this year. So let's do that now. If you forgot your, car, your commitment card or you weren't here two weeks ago, that's fine. We have those commitment cards in the pews. Please take a moment to pass them down. Also, if somebody needs a brochure to look through, it's okay. We've got a few more minutes. We're going to take a few minutes for you to do this if you want. If you need one, then pass them around to the people around you. Also a brochure. And the brochure has a list of the many opportunities to grow your faith here in our parish this year. But listen, you don't have to limit yourself just to what we're doing as a Christian community. Although we just went through how to, we should be doing that together. You can also, also put down, hey, I'm going to make a commitment to pray every day at home. Or I'm going to make a commitment to read the Bible every day. A lot of our prisoners, for instance, are using an, um, a, um, a um, podcast by Father Michael Smith called A Bible in One Year, where every day the podcast gives you a reading from the scriptures and then an explanation. A lot of people say, I don't read the scriptures because I don't understand it. Father Michael Smith reads it to you, like when you're in the car, and then explains it to you. And you can pick it up at any time because it doesn't start with a calendar day. And in one year, you'll have the whole Bible read and explained to you. So you can put something like that that you're doing on your own also. So as you're thinking about that, fill out your card. Let me say this as you're working on that. By making this commitment, you're saying to God, not me, not to those around you, not to our parish, but you're saying to God and to yourself that growing your faith in God matters to you. To you. You are acknowledging that you need the spiritual friendship of others too, which many of these offerings here in our parish will provide. You are stating that faith without works is dead. That is, it isn't enough for you to simply believe in God. You want to choose him, follow him, and do so with others together so that your faith indeed will grow this year. And God and others will inspire in you the desire and decisions to put your growing faith into action, both for your salvation and the salvation of others, like the people who are sitting around you and like the people who are not here who you would like to be here. If you're ready to bring your commitment card to God forward, then please do so now. If you need a moment to fill out your commitment card, please take the moment to do that. I'm just going to ask Matt. Matt, if he'll play some music, and um, we'll take a couple of minutes to allow everyone who wants to, to come forward. And as folks come forward, let us take time to pray for ourselves and one another and our commitments to God to grow our faith this year.